from Little Snake. Oh. <laughs> Hi, ladies and gentlemen. It's Dallas Winston, Bloody Elbow. I'm with Zane Simon, whom I will introduce and consult with briefly, shortly and briefly. Oh. We're going to do a uh, quick one run through of uh, Bellator 131, Tito versus Bonner. It's going to be quick and brief. Zane, your thoughts overall? Uh, short and fast, sweet and to the point. Your thought that is that the show or the card because uh, it really fits for both. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. It, it it'll be th this is sort of a weird. I mean, th this is not like I don't I don't I want to say it's like really strange, but it's sort of a strange offering to me for Bellator in that like there's not even anything at all to talk about on the undercard, but the main card is heavily stacked. Like, they usually just kind of sprinkle guys throughout, you know? They'll have, like, a fight here and there, a prospect here and there that we might be interested in. This is, like, literally nothing, and then a main card. And we've been kind of talking up... It seemed like when we first started doing the Bellator Vivis sections, we were saying, hey, keep an eye on this and that, and the prelims are getting better and better, and... I'm not quite sure what this portends. Maybe they're just holding, you know, holding off to stack up the main cards more. That's the only logical. Well, maybe, and maybe there's like a, a NCAA wrestler or BJJ champ that we just totally don't know. Like maybe one of these guys is somebody we should be excited about, and we're just totally missing them. I mean, that could be too, but I don't feel it. I don't. I don't. My set. My spider sense isn't tingling here. And if I, there's anything I've been blessed with, it's by the sense. It's not tingling? No, not tingling. Maybe you're not rubbing it hard enough. That could be. Don't be gross. Maybe Zane. too hard. It's a professional Maybe show. Too, too hard, and it's just numb. <laughs> Alright, so again, we're going to skip the prelims. If we're missing a prospect, a salivating matchup that uh, we should be discussing, please yell at us about it in the comment section. Otherwise, we're going to start with the opener, which is going to be Nam Fan versus newly turned Bantamweight, Mike Richmond. I'm a fan of Nam Fan. I'm a fan of Fan. But uh, I think this is kind of a rough matchup for him, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that he came back and he's gotten a couple of wins outside the UFC. That's, that's nice to, for me to see. But... Um... He was facing very beatable fighters in those matchups. I mean, he, he went over to Japan and beat a guy named Yuki Baba, who... Uh, has 40 thieves. It has lost uh, three of his last four now with his loss to fan. I mean, he's not got the most terrible record overall, but he's, you know, he's been a decision-heavy fighter on the Japanese circuit, kind of a safe matchup. And then... Kenichi Ito, who's 12 and 12 and 8, so sort of your classic, and almost 40, so your classic journeyman. So, Fan is not fighting at the prime of his skill anymore. It's unfortunate to say that, but it seems like the sort of grinding, high output, fun boxer has been replaced with a grinding, low output, not very fast boxer, and against Richmond, that is not a good plan. On your, you know, when we just went over the fights that he's won recently, I, I can't imagine many fighters uh, that I would forgive more so than Nam Fan. Oh, did, yeah. No, he, you... I mean, it makes sense to me to go out and pick up a couple winnable fights. I'm not saying, like, he shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that picking up a couple winnable fights and then going and bouncing back and taking on Mike Richmond is like, that may be a step too quick. Well, and the reason I said that is because he he's on the tail end of his career. Not that he's going to retire tomorrow, but he spent his prime fighting lightweights, and this is a dude who just now recently moved on to Bantamweight. I think that was mm -hmm. kind of long overdue. In a way, that helped him against everyone but the cream of the crop, because even though he was smaller, his hands are, are so good. He's a really super technical, polished guy. When he first came in, who I think that was the first Leonard Garcia fight. He put together some sweet combinations. I mean, like dipping down, you know, left hook to the liver, 
right hook, and then he would stop for a second, and then Garcia would gather himself like he was going to reset. And with no warning, Fan would whip out a, a spinning kick to the ribs and do it all like in sequence and real fluidly. So the guy's got some skills, but I think against Richmond, that's he's. I mean, so he doesn't have big power. That's the other thing. He's yeah. got good technique. He's actually got a you know, at times, not all the time, but he can. He's shown excellent head movement, really smart entries. Even though he loves that left hook, he doesn't always telegraph it. But uh, against Richmond, I think it's going to be, he's not going to out-brawl him, that's for sure. So I think he's going to really, really, really have to rely on his technical ability. But he hasn't been doing that. He seems to have been willing to just throw his hands lately. Yeah, and I mean, he looks a big step slower lately. I mean, Von Lee just beat him like I had never seen. Yeah, you know, that was like the, the, the career-making performance out of Von Lee and the worst I have ever seen Nam Fan look by a long stretch. And was it Jimmy Hedis too? Didn't Jimmy Hedis like really? I remember Jimmy Hedis and Dennis Seaver. Dennis Seaver just threw him around like a sack of potatoes. Yeah, why would Nam Fan ask for that matchup? That was a terrible matchup. And then I, I want to say round one versus Mike Brown was bad. Like he really got. Yeah. I, I remember scoring that at ten eight. And so I think from what you said that when he dropped down, he was more amongst, you know, fighters his size, but then he didn't have that huge speed advantage. Yeah. And I think that caught him off guard. He's always had and been billed as a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. I don't want to use the exposed word, but I want to say if I were to, to game plan for him, that would be I would much rather deal with his guard than his boxing, that's for sure. Yeah, but I mean I don't think Richmond I think Richmond can just go sit in the pocket and take him out, honestly, at this point. I He's faster, he's more technical and more fluid at this point, and I think he's got all the tools he needs, no matter where this fight goes, unfortunately. We've been talking about Fan a lot because I assume we're both pretty high on Richmond, and I mean this is a good matchup for him. I think Richmond has has developed a real good combination of, of technical boxing, along with just like raw brutality. I mean he's got good technique, and he's fast as hell, and he hits hard as a mofo. Uh, for some reason, I didn't want to swear, even though we do it liberally all, all all the time. But a tough matchup for him. This is one where Fan is, I, I think, you know, anything can always happen in MMA. That's always kind of a cop-out, but a truth. But I do think that Fan will come in here having nothing to lose what, whatsoever, which I think might be uh, an advantage for him because I think he'd be more willing to take a chance. And if he, he's at some point in time, he's going to probably more than he would prefer, he's going to end up in the pocket with Richmond. Yeah, I mean it, it. That that could be. I I just it's really I, hard for me to 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 bank on fan. Oh yeah. Even having like a miracle moment, you know. Yeah, I agree. That's um. I was trying to maybe make the case for that miracle moment, but either way, I guess that kind of says it. Really, really tough matchup for him. I think he's going to be undersized, underpowered. Uh, and his technique, he, he's more dynamic, and his technique is really solid, but I just don't think he's going to get a lot of mileage out of that, really. No. Um, I wouldn't mind to see him just surprise. To me, he's got to, anytime there's a matchup like this where we're talking about like just trying to drum up a case for one of the guys, it's a good opportunity for them to come out and do something very uncharacteristic or something that we're not expecting. So, I don't know, shoot for a takedown. Some Roll for a knee bar. <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, because Richmond, it's not that he has a weakness whatsoever on the ground, but there is a person where you absolutely would rather be, you know, dealing with him on the ground versus standing up. So um, this did, uh, I did title this including betting odds, but I forgot, I guess we're doing the show early. There are no posted betting odds on bestfightodds.com for this. So I lied. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um. You ready to move on to the next one? This will yeah, be... yeah. Let, let, let's move on. That, that that got me down. Like that, we started at a low ebb, and then we just like swung it a little lower. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, let's get all peppy. That's oh. not, it's not down to you. You didn't book Nam Fan to fight Mike Richmond. You know, it's not on you. You don't know that for sure. Uh, this will be a stand and wang. I mean, for people who want to see just stand up violence, I mean, this fight was basically made for you in mind. With you in mind, Melvin Manhu versus Joe Schilling. Joe Schilling has uh, so glory, and I believe his t that he's the middleweight champion of the 2013 Glory Middleweight Tournament. Or mm -hmm. I said that all backwards. 
middleweight tournament champion, 2013. Excellent, phenomenal kickboxer. He has, I believe he's a one, one in three in MMA. He, uh, from what I understand, a ton of MMA guys brought him in when they were fighting a real talented, skilled striker slash kickboxer. And he does have, for a kickboxer, he has a style that's really do to MMA, i.e., like he's a mean motherfucker. He's not gonna like look to throw these artful combinations and dance out of range. I mean, uh, he's a mean bastard, nasty, nasty elbows, and he's the kind of dude that fights looking to knock people's you know heads off. Which I think that's a big reason why Melvin did so good in MMA is because he's not looking to point fight or be fluid or show a lot of finesse. I mean, he's looking to use his skills for mass destruction and carnage. Yeah. Any thoughts on this one? I mean, I'm not sure what to say about it. It's too probably this has got to be amongst the two best kickboxers we've ever seen in an MMA cage, right? Like top ten. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, it's well, Man Manhoff is one of the the few guys who fought who's fought not only in kickboxing but consistently in MMA. I mean, like, because you know, obviously you've got like Semi Schultz, but you've got guys who've taken off like one off. MMA fights here and there and stuff like that. So I don't really know where Schilling would rank among those or Manhoff would rank among those. But there's certain. I mean, Manhoff himself is certainly one of the guys who's probably done. You know, he's among the best for having a combination kickboxing and MMA career. Like him and Crow Cop and Hunt and uh, Schilt are probably guys that ha and uh, Overeem. But Overeem's a good one because with Crow Cop, Hunt, and Schilt, and correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they do one or the other? Like they either said, I'm doing MMA now or I'm doing kickboxing now? Well, that may be, but they've, I mean, they, they've <clears throat> sprinkled in, like they've had successful careers in both, you know? True, true. Like they, they've, they've spent significant amounts of time in both career. I mean, even more than Spong, who just seems to be sort of like slowly dabbling. Yep, that's another good offering. So w with this one, it's like, um, I don't know. The, uh, I don't have a ton to say about this one. I mean, it's going to be two of the most devastating and talented kickboxers with, you know, tiny little gloves on. So Yeah, um, part of me just wonders, like, should I be sh should I be trying to think of this like a kickboxing match? And who would win a, this kickboxing match right now? Because if it's a kickboxing match, like, I don't know... If I would pick Melvin Manhoff to win, you know, his kickboxing lately, he's been on a bit of a skid. He's not been doing that great. He's a pretty old fighter for kickboxing and for MMA. But in MMA, his skills translate so so well, and that power still keeps up, and there are so few guys who can match him technically on the feet. So... It's a very hard fight to book to, to look at and say I know exactly what's going to happen because I mean Schilling quite frankly has failed to do anything of note in an MMA cage. And I, this is one where I highly doubt that Manhoff is going to you know say hey I've done MMA more I'm going to surprise him and duck under his combo and shoot shoot a double leg you know oh, so yeah. I imagine this is going to be the most high stakes pure kickboxing match because. With these gloves on, like one little mistake, you know. And the other thing with Schilling is, I would give him a serious advantage with how do I want to say this? With strikes using parts of your body that are not padded whatsoever, elbows, knees. I mean, um, he is an extremely nasty and talented guy, and he uses. I want to say, uh, actually, I don't. I can't say I'm super familiar with with Melvin as a pure kickboxer. But I would say, uh, based on what I've seen from Mel Melvin in MMA, Schilling just throws more tools out there. You know, Melvin, and believe me, he d gets plenty of work done with it, but he's basically a, a low-kick right right and left-hand guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Melvin's not... like no Nobody's putting Melvin Manhoff up there on the pedestal of all-time great kickboxes. He's not. Like, that's not something that... You know, that's just not an accolade he's ever going to be have earned. I assume you mean in kickboxing because in the MMA world, I'd put no, him on no, the list. I mean, in kickboxing, all-time yeah. great kickboxers, not all-time great MMA fighters who kickbox. Yep, I would thing. I would agree with that. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to lend a pick. I actually might be leaning Schilling just a little bit here. I'm gonna go with Manhoff, not 
because I think like I mean like it, it's I just can't trust this like booking looking at it as like a pure technical striking kickboxing match because even Tyrone Spong given guys who just want to brawl with him like he almost got beat by a really mediocre light heavyweight in his last fight and who was just sitting you know sitting right in front of him and and brawling going strike for strike. And I think Manhoff is so much better attuned to the kind of striking that MMA that works in MMA that I can't pick Schilling, whose last fight in M- in MMA was in 2008, to come in and just work him over. I could see it, but that's actually a really good point. I'm giving you that one because, um, and to me, like not to go too far astray here, but I think that's why a lot of, some of the uh, MMA guys that did fairly well. In, in kickboxing, especially like over him, I think he fought those kickboxing matches like it was an MMA fight, like mm-hmm. that you know two two gloves right underneath his chin and just slowly like stalk forward and look to you know just like discharge a massive you know thunder shot rather than try to you know snap off a couple protect yourself, get out of the pocket. I mean, he was like a shark coming forward just looking to destroy people. So I think those mechanics actually will be a pretty, uh, I don't know, an, an, an advantage for, for Melvin here. But either way, I mean, I don't know. Someone's going to, you know, fall over. And this yeah. should actually be a good one. I mean... It should be a hell of a lot of fun. We'd have to dig through the archives to find, you know, obviously, like, Crow Cop Hunt and Pride back in the day did, like, you know, Stefan Laco got a few fights. But this has got to be somewhere uh, on the list of some of the most talented kickboxers we've seen, you know, throw down in an MMA cage, I would I'd reckon. <clears throat> It, it it's definitely um it has an it, it's a rare fight in MMA I would say you know it, it it it's it's a fight that we don't get to see very often of guys who have you know like I say maybe maybe aren't like best in the world kickboxers but who have very good careers in kickboxing or very solid decent careers in kickboxing come over to er, and are now gonna fight in an MMA arena that's just not something you get to see that often and I like it like I hope Coker does some more of this you know mm-hmm. like I, I'd love to see some cross I wouldn't even mind seeing like, like some straight kick, kickboxing matches I know some people t- had talked about maybe uh, some kind of relationship already, but either way we don't get to see it all the time you definitely aren't going to be able to say it's a bunch of chumps who you could find down at the bar throwing sloppy shots so I'm cool with it and I'm glad they are because this next uh, matchup uh, lost uh, an opponent in it to me, it, it's kind of a big bummer. So the, King Mo was supposed to fight like jujitsu god almost. Um, Tom to blast, to blast dropped out. He was injured. Doesn't even know if he's going to come back to MMA or not. Or I guess that he left that kind of open. And uh, stepping in is uh, middleweight Joe Vitapo to fight light heavyweight King. Joe's a tough dude. All the heart in the world. A real blue, you know, likable blue collar guy. That being said, I don't. It's kind of like the fan fight. I think we're really going to have to get creative to map out a, a positive strategy for him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- this is the unfortunately the constant um, crux of light heavyweight right now, which is that if you want a guy on short notice, it's almost never going to be a light heavyweight. It's always a middleweight. Even for the UFC, you look at all the guys. The 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 short notice light heavyweights that the UFC's pulled up, guys like Keith Barish, um, I'm trying to remember uh, who. Uh, there's, there's a couple others. Oh, Navarro. Um, these guys are all 185ers on the regional scene, who were you know a little heavy because they're out of their camp right now. Got a short notice call up and said, "Oh yeah, I can make 205. That's yeah. fine." It's funny when you're walking around at like 195, how you can how you can make 205 without any problems. Yeah, and so that's where we are again. We've got a pretty legit, not even a huge light heavyweight, but a legit light heavyweight in King Mo. Still a guy who's, you know, maybe maybe not maybe a notch out of the elite ranks right now, but well above the rank and file of the division. And he's taking on a guy who doesn't fight there on short notice. Those guys never win. Like, you never... 
the guy who fights out of his weight division on a week's notice will win like one time out of a hundred, you know. Well, in in Vitapo's strength is is his wrestling, and you know yeah. maybe that might you know get him some mileage against uh, anyone else, but you know against King Mo, that's gonna you know his best weapon is gonna be uh, would appear to to be neutralized. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry about all that. And I mean, Mo's gonna have a huge striking advantage. So even if Joe can, you know, really surprise people and work as hard to try to equalize the wrestling, I think he's gonna be in deep shit in the stand-up department. A couple past names. I don't even think they're on the roster anymore. But I bet. Well, I know uh, Mpumbu is, but he just went down to 185. I would much rather see Christian move back up to 205 for this fight. Attila Vey would have actually have been a really good fight against King Mo. Yeah, oh, even well, Travis but, Few. Well, <laughs> I don't know about Travis Few. Let's not go that far. Well, but, I'd rather see that. Well, he he, you know, kill himself trying to make 205 again. But uh, yeah. I guess let's go with the other two. I honestly, no, I don't want to go that far because actually, you know, so Joe, let's. Uh, I guess he's smaller. He's real athletic. I mean, there's a chance he's going to be able to use, you know, his quickness that the, I mean, I'm not saying he's going to get anywhere, but when you're faced with a guy who's got more technique and more areas than you are and who's bigger and stronger, you got to be smart as hell and use all the quickness and athleticism that you have to try to compensate for it. I mean, Joe's not even a big finisher either. So this no. is, you know, it's going to be a tough one. Yeah. This is going to be a rough matchup, but Hey, the next fight isn't, Next fight's going to be awesome. Let's talk about that. It will, actually. And I'm excited for this one. Will Brooks, Michael Chandler. I don't remember the first time if I picked Brooks or not, but I feel like I was giving him a good chance. And um, First of all, that first fight was pretty pretty solid. Yeah? Oh, yeah. It was a great fight. Although, I mean, it, it left me with a really serious question about, like, my, about Michael Chandler, honestly, because... He did not look good. Like, he didn't, you know, it was a good fight, but he did not look like his normal self. He did not look like he was going out and being the normal, aggressive Michael Chandler who had zero fear of taking on Eddie Alvarez in every a lot, phase. A lot of people said that, and then I don't think it was Chandler, it might have been his manager, said after the fact that he had uh, a back injury, but yeah. still wanted to, you know, step up and not pull out. <clears throat> And that pissed Will Brooks off even more after he heard that. Yeah. So I know, like, um, you know, Will's, like, all fired up for this one because he, you know, when he first came in, it was that real heart-wrenching story about, uh, you know, his, his adopted mother. And um, not that that was wrong or whatever, but you got this this picture as far as the, the fighter outside the cages. You know, a good dude, big heart. And lately now, I think he's kind of changed that a little bit to the point where he's kind of pissed off and he feels like he's been a little overlooked. And then after Chandler said that the first time, or after their first fight, that it was his back, uh, from what I hear, he's... <clears throat> he's <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know what my problem is talking. He's really coming out for blood in this next one. And I do think that he's a little bit more diverse and a little more interesting. So tell me if I'm wrong here, but Michael Chandler is either going to lunge forward and throw one-twos, or he's going to lunge forward and change levels and take you down, yeah? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think he, he's gotten a bit more interesting and diverse in his angles on his boxing than just lunging straight forward. Like, he's, you know, he's a little more studied than that, a little craftier. Um, but he's certainly going to pressure fight the whole way through. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, and I didn't mean to imply straightforward because he does. And I do think when he first started, he did just come forward and either yeah. punch or take, you know, or change levels. And he has gotten a little more artful as far as his entries. But I do think still the end result is he's going to come right at you, look to get right at your face, and he's going to explode with either punches up high or a, or a takedown uh, down low. And whether or not it will, you know, actualize as an advantage, I do think that Will Brooks has shown a lot, a lot more tools. He's got kind of a weird, not Emmanuel Newton esque weird, but he'll throw some high kicks. He throws like a hopping side kick from range quite a bit. Um, he does just some weird shit, atypical, that you don't really expect. And I'm guessing that might be a little bit of a factor here. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and in par partially, like, 
this is the question I keep coming back to, which is, is Will Brooks a much better athlete than Michael Chandler? That was a big question coming in, and I don't want to totally buy into the back thing, because I, if I were to watch that fight, I would have said, wow, I think that, yeah, geez, he kind of proved that. I do think that he was better in scrambles, like almost a better submission yeah. grappler. So even though Chandler seemed to be able to take him down early in the fight, Brooks ended up taking his back, and he was much more clever at you know transitions and being able to just jump on openings and get in a more dominant position. But I do have to say, and this is hard, it's all opinion, but it didn't seem like the same Michael Chandler. Although then again... That could be his back. It could have been like shit. He was faced with a guy who's stronger and is just as good or better, you know, better of an athlete than he is. Yeah, and I mean, cause, cause, and this is like you know a little um, beyond just what you see on paper kind of thing. But it's it sort of like Chandler should be a little further along in his career development. You know, he's been doing this a little longer. He's been working in the gym, he's been taking these top fights for a little longer, he's got um, just a little more training time under his belt. And so he should be a little further along as a fighter than Brooks. I mean, Brooks still is has is very young in his career. He's only been fighting since 2011. Which and is pretty phenomenal, considering how, for both of those guys. I mean, it's rare that we can say that someone has shown just as much... Uh, improvement over a short time as Chandler. Yeah, so it, the question I think is, is Will Brooks headed to be like the very elite of lightweight? Because if he is, then there's a very good chance that he beats Michael Chandler again. And that's the hard thing for me to predict. Like, I, Part of me wants to say that he's going to win this, but part of me also wants to say that, you know, Chandler is a very, very good lightweight heading into his prime. Like, still not even quite there, but just getting into the prime of his career. We shouldn't still have seen the best of Michael Chandler. He's only been fighting for five years. That's not, you know... Like, we, we should be... His best years should still be ahead of him. Um, And if his best years are still ahead of him... Like, it, this is just... It, it's, a too, it's almost a too-close-to-call fight. I mean, it was a split decision last time. And there's that specter of an injury hanging over it. And I think in my heart I'm picking Michael Chandler, but I expect this to be a very close fight. I think I'm going to take Brooks. And the thing that I see as Chandler's probably biggest advantage is his uh, finishing potency. So Brooks is extremely talented, athletic, dynamic, you know, well-rounded, all those things that we've said. Uh, but I think definitely, I've, definitively, Michael Chandler has you know the edge in, in finishing power. Yeah, uh, and that's think... part of the thing with Brooks though, because he doesn't plant and throw like home runs, and that makes him really tough to read and mount offense on and to figure out what he's going to do. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. I, th I think the other thing that skews it in my favor, in, Ch in Chandler's favor, to me, is that. You know, not only is he a very defensively sound, um, well, you know, he's got a great chin. He, he's not like the most marvelous defensive boxer, but he's got a great chin. He's very, very good submission defense, but he's a high pressure fighter. And absolutely, high pressure fighters tend to win rounds. Like that's that's how you win in MMA is by being the guy who's always in the, in his opponent's face, who's always right there, who's always throwing, who's always working for the takedown, who's always going after his opponent. And, um, I mean, Brooks isn't a bad pressure fighter, but I think that Chandler pushes, pushes that just a little further than Brooks does. Yeah, Chandler's explosive pressure, like yeah. fan-friendly, like, you know, scintillating combinations, where Brooks is more of like a lurking like mm -hmm. pressure where he'll slowly just try to establish his will and he's the kind of guy that almost enjoys taking someone down and just you know beating on him not trying to finish just keeping him there and breaking him which yeah. is not fan friendly but I definitely would not want to be the dude on the opposite end of that either so this is really fascinating because the first one brought out all kinds of questions was Chandler really not that good is Will Brooks always been you know on the level of the elite and we didn't know it yet 
was Chandler just not ready for the shit Brooks threw at him? Was Chandler's back injured? Uh, I don't know any of that shit, but I know it makes me really, really excited to see this matchup. I think this is going to be a good one. And I do think eventually that Brooks will work himself into the elite of the uh, of the lightweight division. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly on pace for it. You know, he's got sort of one, not maybe fluky, but pretty fluky KO loss on his record. I mean, Sadawad's a power, a good power boxer, but anytime you see a guy get knocked out in, like, the first 30 or 40 seconds of a fight, like... Yeah, he, you know, he did something wrong, he got caught, he wasn't expecting to get hit the way he did, that's not a fluke, his opponent was trying to knock him out and he did, but it's not like a systematic destruction over three rounds where a guy's just clearly better than you and outgunning you in every area. Yep, totally agree, and even if there was some kind of truth to it, like you said, when a guy comes out of his corner and 20 seconds later he's snoozing, there's always going to be that fluky element to it. Yeah, and and so after that, like, I mean, beyond that, his career, you know, his career path is of a very elite fighter in the making. You know, he's constantly taken steps up in competition all the way. He's continued to win all the way through. He's still young in his career. He's, you know, and he, maybe he's 28, but that's not a big deal. I mean, that's it, when you've been fighting for four years, you've been fighting for four years. He's still in his 20s. He's very likely going to be good up into his early to mid-30s. Yeah, I mean, that means he's got four or five, maybe even six years before people start putting him in the old category and considering yeah. he hasn't been fighting far. So I expect big things from him. So we're, we both respect both. We think it's going to be a good fight, but I'm edging Brooks and you're edging towards Chandler, yeah? Yep. All right, nice. All right, main event <clears throat> with a weird-ass setup. Weird. Uh, I mean, why did Homeboy yeah. have... It's weird enough he had one mask on. Why did he have two? Like, that is, like, head-scratching. I, I, I don't know. I, if I, I could answer that question, I feel like I'd know a lot of deeper truths about the universe. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm glad you didn't limit it. The universe is correct. So we're talking about Stefan Bonner, Tito Ortiz. Um, I was, like, a huge, huge... I mean, I'm still a big fan of Tito, but back in the day when he was wrecking light heavyweight, I was a really, really, really big fan of Tito. Um, a lot of my, uh, well, I guess what I'm going to end up saying here is I, Stefan Bonner is extremely talented, but kind of like what we, uh, we were saying was so good about Chandler, just offensively potent. Bonner's composed, but he doesn't, to me, strike me as the kind of guy where, oh, shit, I need to worry about ABC. I mean, he's really good everywhere, but is there really something? I mean, to me, the biggest thing for Tito to fear is his submission grappling. Yeah, I mean... The biggest thing for either guy to fear is age. I mean, that's like... <laughs> I thought you said AIDS for a minute there. I was like, ooh. No, not AIDS. The plot thickens. My screen's <laughs> oh. frozen, in, so I'm just going by sound. Look, we're not going to get into this whole Justin McCulley, he slept with my... Like, no. That's... We're way out of field there. Sorry. But, um... Not AIDS. Age. I mean... Okay. <laughs> I'm ready to move on now. Yeah. Um, that's, that's it, like, Tito's 39, Bonner's 37, uh, Tito came back and beat Alexander Slomenko in not a great fight, not, like, a, a fight where you're like, oh, classic Tito, he's back, but sort of a, like, wow, what the hell was Slomenko thinking right there, like, yeah. You know, t he was beating Tito up, and then Tito just walked him into the against the cage, got you know, drug him down because he's way bigger than him, and subbed him out quickly. And you know, we've seen from Schmenko since then is other better fighters be able to do the exact same thing quicker and more violently. What's crazy is he had to know Tito has limited ways to win. So as yeah. soon as he got taken down, of course that's bad. But then as soon as he you know uh, rolled over and took a knee to try to escape. And Tito got onto his back and started going for the choke. At that point, you dedicate all your efforts to hand fighting that choke off. But he continued to try to. That was just really weird. And you'd think like that veteran craft and savvy would have been his big advantage in that fight. Yeah, I think Flamenco's just been a very one track fighter his whole career. Like, he just focuses on his kickboxing and staying upright, and that's it. And. It just doesn't, the rest of it doesn't really occur, you know? Yeah, that was weird. So, so 
<clears throat> Go I gotta, ahead. I gotta take Bonner here. Just I think, you know, he's done better late. Like it, the end of his career has been much better than the end of Tito's career. I think Bonner still has a little left in the tank. I think Tito quit like at a time that it made pretty good sense. You know, I mean, actually well past the point that it made sense for him to quit. And then came back and won a fight against a much smaller fighter that he was able to muscle around. And I don't think he can do that against Bonner. Yeah, if you take away when he submitted Bader, which was, you know, fucking beyond shocking. Yeah. Um, I mean, all, all credit to Tito, though. That was that was really crafty, actually. With the, he faked a level change and then came high. And actually, when he jumped on that guillotine, that was really smart, too, because Bader was already recovered. So mm-hmm. he could have tried to play it safe and got on top and won the round. Big balls, you know, to jump for that guillotine. So credit to Tito for that. Here's the only thing that I'm curious, and, like, how, how does Stefan Bonner usually win fights? I mean, I know he's extremely well-rounded. He's, like, B-plus to A-minus everywhere, right? Striking, wrestling. Mm-hmm. I actually think his jiu-jitsu is probably his best asset. And yeah. his, stri- his striking is really good, too, except it doesn't seem to be powerful. And I like um, he doesn't use his hands a lot. You know, he's he's got a lot of kicks, which is good. It's more dynamic. But I think against Tito, he's going to want to become more of a boxer because you know Tito is going to shoot. And if you're wheeling for a spinning kick or a low kick, it's a hell of a lot harder to stuff in an underhook and stay upright than it is if you're just you know with in a low stance throwing your hands. Yeah, I, I it's just so hard for me to technically like bookend this fight and say, oh, if this guy does this technique and this guy does this technique, it's sort of like, well, X stays healthy, then we've, he'll we've said win. That for like, we've said that for like three of the five fights. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, Class A analysis, bitches. That's why everyone's tuning but in. I mean, because it's seriously like how much power is left in Tito's shot. Like, is Tito going to... If Stefan Bonner throws a kick... To the body, is Tito gonna still be able to like get in and run that, run him down? Is he powerful enough and fast enough to do that anymore? Is you know, or can I mean Stefan Bonner? His, his whole his career wins are all vol accumulation. He's an accumulation finisher. He's the kind of guy who gets ahead of you a little and keeps pushing you and keeps pushing the pace and keeps you know, just keeps pouring it on you for longer and longer to the point that you're breaking and he's still there pouring it on. And that kind of fighting, I think, just lends itself to more success still than Tito's. Like, I just, I, I, his, it, you know, his whole thing was dependent on him having a really athletic, powerful shot. And I think the big thing he's maintained and actually developed over time is having a power grappling game much more so than he used to have. But I think Bader is... Or Bonner, rather. Bonner is strong enough and savvy enough to not let that happen, but I can't, like... I can't trust that. I, there's nothing to trust in this fight. That's the thing I think that I keep having the problem with. On either side. I would say, I, you know, Tito did make really good strides with his boxing. Because <clears throat> if you watched him early in his career, his, his striking was... Just really elementary, not to sound yeah. like a dick, but the only thing. So he's actually done pretty well with his boxing. You know, a lot of guys that he was able to stand up with and throw good. You know, he's got he throws pretty good combinations. But the only missing element, and it might just go back to what you were saying about having the ability to shoot with power, is it doesn't flow well with his wrestling. Yeah. So he's either standing up. I'm standing up right now, or and he still shoots from like a mile out sometimes mm-hmm. if you can see it coming. So, and who knows, it's not like we can, uh, probably, we shouldn't be talking about, like, massive improvements here, but the door is open. I mean, I would like to see, if I were Stefan Bonner, considering his background and his frame, I would try to replicate kind of like the Force Griffin strategy of staying outside, throwing hard leg kicks, a lot of circling, mm-hmm. and then just fighting as tough as you can when and if Tito ever gets his greasy mitts on you. Because yeah. that's the other thing. I mean, if Tito gets in the... We talk about him being in free movement outside where, you know, no one's connected. But if Tito is able to get his hands in and get that body lock, then how fast he can explode forward. You know, I mean, he's still a beefy, strong bastard. I think if he gets that body lock on, 
Bonner's going to have to rely on his submission ability. I think that's tough. I do think that Tito has had kind of underrated submission ability, especially submission defense. Yeah, I, like I say, there's just so much I can't trust here. Like, way too much I can't trust. Because, I mean, that the other part of this, too, is Stefan Bonner getting beat by Mark Coleman. Like, you know, we say that Mark Coleman, at the point that Mark Coleman beat Stefan Bonner, was, like, better than Tito now. Like, you know, both guys are pushing 40. Both guys are pushing 40, and... Like, there's just so much, like, I mean, I don't know. Stefan Bonner is great when he has a physical advantage that he can push on his opponent. That's really the thing. When he's b- the bigger, stronger man in the cage, um, and or the, the better athlete, and that hasn't happened that often, um, he can punish his opponent really well when he's not the better athlete when he's not the stronger man when he's not the more dominant physical fighter out there he tends to get folded up and I don't know where Tito is right now because that fight against Alexander Shlomenko told me absolutely nothing other than that Tito can still be a pretty good physical grappler yeah And I think that's going to be, if he can get there, that's going to be his best tool here. And I don't see, I mean, when we talk about Tito being able to initiate that position, that brings about questions of him, his movement, his age. But how is Bonner going to keep him off? I mean, he's going to, that's why I go back to the, he's going to have to really be a range fighter. You know, be as elusive as possible. If Tito's, you know, if if the physicality has gone out of his wrestling, then Bonner could keep him off just by being big and strong. You know, in Bonner, I don't think he, strength-wise, he can't even come close to Tito because that's where his long, lanky frame will work against him. But what he is good at is using that leverage in the clinch. And he's got a pretty feisty clinch. You know, he looks like a scrawny dude. Go ahead. But what version of Tito are we basing that off of? You know, yeah, I mean, like... Yeah, I know. Like, I think, yeah, I mean, you go back five years and Tito wins this fight every time. Like, that's, I think, the thing is that that I'm like I, I think that's reasonable that Tito Ortiz at his best was much better fighter than Stefan Bonner at his best. Oh yeah. I mean but yeah, I, Tito fought all top guys before he got, you know, canned from the UFC. Yeah. But I feel like he slid further than Bonner has slid that peak. Could be. So to wrap this up I'm going Tito. I'm going Bonner. All right. That works out nice then. Um, yeah. <clears throat> all right. So, yeah, geez, I guess that's it. Show was <clears> – <throat> spe- <clears throat> dude, with this ass voice. We spent a lot more time in the main card because we skipped the prelims. But, um, this, I mean, this is going to be one I'm going to have to sit down and watch no, no matter what. Even uh, yeah. I'm actually looking forward to Fan and Richmond, Manhof Schilling. I mean, that kind of says it all. I'll watch King Mo and Vita po just with that, you know, could – you know, something amazing happened there. And Joe is a good guy to take that fight because he does, he gives zero fucks. He will come in and just throw his complete heart on the line, which might be sad if he gets beat down because he's a real good kid. But um, And then at, kind of that's kind of the same with Bonner Ortiz. You know, it's not like we're competing for a, a number one contender slot. But uh, this whole card is going to be watchworthy to me. I'm, I'm definitely going to be down for it. Oh, yeah. I mean, if nothing else, I'm, I'm always interested in seeing – like what? What does a fighter do with an opponent they're supposed to to smash? Like, how well do they perform? Do they go out there and just blitz the guy? Do Do they meet that expectation? So to that point, like I'm still interested in watching Richmond and Lawal because they're faced Deep with an opponent that they're supposed to just go out there and blow through, and yes. whether or not they can do that, um. I don't know. Like, I, I mean, I, I think they should, but it's. I, I'm always interested to see that. And then otherwise, you've got really interesting, competitive, and at some point strange matches in Manhoff Schilling, Brooks Chandler, and Ortiz Bonner, where I seriously can't. Like, I, I I'm not confidently picking any of those fights. Agreed. Final words. Final thoughts before we. Um. So this is the end of the Bellator season, right? 
Yeah, and after this, well, even though, I mean, this has been a break. It's been a couple of weeks since their last show, but uh, I, I guess the forecast now is not to do the, you know, off for a month or two and then go balls yeah. out for 12 weeks. So, so, so I, don't I mean, know. We, we, we should take a minute, like, ow, oh, sorry, my dog just punched me. Um, how, like, how's this season been? It's been, like, what, what, what are your thoughts going into the end of the Bellator season? Are you glad it's, it's done, or did you, like, did this give you any, like, nostalgia of, like, oh, you know, I really would be excited for the next season to come around? I think Coker coming on board, and even though he came on a while ago, I think this is his first card. Don't quote me on that, but I think, uh, you know, all the other shows prior to this were booked under the uh, uh, Bjorn Redney regime. Uh, bringing in Cohen in, um, you know, doing the Joe Schilling, Melvin Manhoof thing, um, no matter what, I mean, even if this, you know, was, like, portended ominously, I would still look forward to, to watching Bellator right now. Um, there's been, yeah, little shades, and on top of that, there's a little mystery because we're not exactly sure what's going to happen or where it's going to go. Um, I think the idea of making big name tournaments, tournaments has always been my always been my favorite. I think the UFC has really missed out on that, like old school pride. Like to me, that is like the glory years of MMA. So I hope he makes tournaments. Not here's some guys who might be good. You might recognize from the last one who. You know, we're good and are still trying to be. I mean, there'll be stacked tournaments, so just that alone would make me excited. But yeah, I mean, go ahead. No, no thoughts about like the death of the season format. Like, um, I think it's gonna be a good thing, really, because yeah. it's so hard to, you know. So going back to what you said about bringing Vita Po up, light heavyweight is hard. That is one thing that is extremely difficult for anyone besides the UFC because the UFC has such a vast roster. God, well, does that come in handy when someone pulls out, you know? Even they can't do it with light heavyweight. Even they end up booking late notice middleweights to fight light heavyweights, you know? Right. So with Bellator not having that deep of a roster, that cripples them even more. And then when you had a weekly show where no matter what, every damn week we're booked, someone's got to go out there. That made it, you know, I think that exacerbated that problem. So, I don't know, little little things in the mix. Yeah, I'm still encouraged, though. I, I think more than anything, the thing that's encouraging to me is there was a lot of, you know, who the hell, la you know, LOL, this guy will be fighting for Bellator, or who the hell is this guy in the belt. At least now it seems like people are craving or at least very uh, more open to the appeal of just an alternative. You know, like the UFC has been doing their thing for a while. I'm not like all off that wagon, but, you know, I'm ready for an alternative is all. Yeah, no, I think that it's what, they're, what they're doing with the uh, basically like grabbing up every former UFC star who's in retirement and bringing them all over to Bellator shows to hang out and Drink beer is uh, they're trying. I, I like the stage they're setting. Is like, you know, come watch all your favorite fight, all your favorite fighters that you used to love. Watch Bellator. They've been somewhat selective about that though, because they didn't want to touch Fitch or Shields or well, Okami. No, we're not active fighters. We're talking like Vondale Silva and yeah. Hoist Gracie and yeah. Frank Shamrock Randy and Kapoor. all the guys that really had a big name that fans love, even if they're not fighting, but saying like, you know, Randy Couture. It's like Randy Couture loves Bellator. Randy Couture doesn't want UFC. Randy Couture wants Bellator. It's smart. It is. It's and, and the fact that they've been selective about it shows that people can't say, you know, anyone who was with the UFC before, they're just signing them up now. So, yeah, I like that too. Yeah, it's fun. It'll be interesting to see how much how, how much more they can play that up in the future when they're putting on more singular shows and more, like, shows that they can promote and push as a single event and whether it's going to be more of a, like... You know, oh, all the stars are out for Bellator 135 or something, you know. And I'd be down to watch, you know, Wandy. You know, shit, because he can go 185 or 205, so. Well, you might not be able to watch him fight, but you might be there, you know, watching him, like. Oh, watch him watch fights. Watch him watch fights, that's right. 
You have Vondelay Silva fight commentary in English. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually love to hear that. All right, we're going to wrap it up. You want to plug yourself? or you Oh, know, sure. Uh, you can find me at Zane Simon over on Twitter and, of course, at Bloody Elbow um, all the rest of the time. And uh, I'll be doing another vivisection for World Series of Fighting this week and another one. Dallas and I will be doing another one for the UFC this week along with Connor. And uh, I've got an MMA prospectus episode coming up on Friday night, I believe, and uh, probably the sixth round after UFC 181. So if you are 180, so if you can't get enough of me, you know, I'll be everywhere. Jesus. Well, I'm going to go watch TV. That's it. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. That's the end. So. All right, uh, give us a like. How do they do that, Zane, on YouTube? Uh, the thumbs up. The thumbs up gives us a like. That's the important part. That's, like, how we value ourselves, get self-worth. Um, may, you know, that's the that's the, the scraping for change, the gutter of, you know, <laughs> humanity that is YouTube. <laughs> My screen's frozen, but I'm going to trust that you were able to handle the thumbs up sign with proper form and technique. <laughs> I, think I, I think I got that. I have that much trust and confidence in you. Other than that, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye. <laughs>